in 1935. I was 15 in a Christian college, and at that time, very important discoveries of necessarily human paintings in caverns in the south of Spain were made, and the specialists said, very likely, these paintings date back to about 15,000 years from now. In my book of religious teachings, it was written that the first appearance of man on earth dated back to about 40 centuries before Jesus. I said him, what is the credible? The father said me, no, no. Please, don't confuse two things. You have the signs and you have religion. If there is something uh, which is not in accordance, it's the religion who, who said the truth. But I told him it is impossible. It's a well-established fact that the, the first appearance of man on earth cannot be evaluated to this time. It is impossible. We were um, educated. Religion said something, and science said another thing. I said to myself, something is going wrong. The future doctor, Bucay, born in pont levesque in northern France in 1920, couldn't have known, or even guessed, on commencing his medical career around 1945, what would have been the residual of that inconvenient encounter with his Catholic teacher a decade earlier. The seemingly doomed showdown of science and religion, as crystallized by his instructor, had apparently set young Maurice on a path of discovery that would consume his entire life. Bukai had set out to examine the Holy Scriptures themselves in the light of modern scientific knowledge. Bukai recalls that during his employment years at the surgical clinic at the University of Paris in 1945, and even much later, how much he got involved in discussions about the viability of considering religion from a scientific perspective. The outcome of his encounters were not altogether unexpected to Bukai. He wrote, the materialist atheist scientist is unable to find in Judeo-Christian writings any language that is even vaguely similar to his own. They contain so many improbabilities, contradictions, and incompatibilities with modern scientific data that he refuses to take texts into consideration that the vast majority of theologians would like to see accepted as an inseparable whole. Those scientists are left today, Bukai concludes, in a state of indifference and even disdain to religious matters they perceive originating from a body of myths. In the Gospel of Luke, for example, you are between Adam and Jesus, 76 generations are mentioned. That is not possible. Bukai had noted early on that when science and religion are discussed in the West, people are quite willing to confine themselves to Judaism and Christianity, but they hardly ever consider Islam. Exegi in Christian or Jewish communities think that the religious teachings were inspired to the author of the Bible, but 
considering the things which are not religious teachings, it's a fact that they wrote according to the ideas, superstition, myth of their time. Alors, il l'a fait en tant que catholique, mais il s'est intéressé à l'islam. Et je ne sais pas du reste dans quelles conditions il ne me l'a pas dit. Et il a vu que dans le Coran, on insiste beaucoup, comme vous le savez, sur la création. Les, la création qui est un signe de Dieu, ayat, les signes de Dieu dans, dans l'univers, dans la création. Et je pense qu'il a, il a, il a bien vu que, que le Coran euh, montrait que, au fond, la création était un, un don de Dieu et en même temps un, un appel de Dieu, que, que, euh, que nous étions des créatures. Bon. Indeed, there was no way then for an increasingly inquisitive Bukai to understand, let alone appreciate, any feature of the Islamic culture. For what appeared to be a deeply rooted principle of misconception in his Western education about Islam had left on him a seemingly indelible impression for a long time. He wrote, As I grew up, I was always taught that Muhammad was the author of the Quran. I remember seeing French translations bearing this information. I was invariably told that the author of the Quran simply compiled in a slightly different form stories of sacred history taken from the Bible. The author was said to have added or removed certain passages while setting forth the principles and rules of the religion he himself had founded. Most people in the West have been brought up on misconceptions concerning Islam and the Quran. For a large part of my life, I myself was one such person. When I was at that time in, the, in approximately in the 40s, received Muslim patients in Paris And when I had the opportunity to speak with uh, many of them uh, concerning their religion, uh, for me, originally, I thought that the Quran was the work of a man. Throughout a good deal of the 60s, Bukai happened to be treating Muslim patients in Paris. As he observed, they often referred to their book, the Quran, in a language that was totally foreign to him. Bukai had finally come to the conclusion that in order to correctly satisfy the requisites of textual analysis of the Holy Scriptures, an educational decision had to be taken, albeit a little late. I took the decision to learn Arabic in Paris. I was 50 exactly at that time. And so the freshman Bukai of the autumn class of 1970 had enrolled to study Arabic in Paris's prestigious National Institute of Oriental Languages. The students are able to read the parts of the Quran which are not too much difficult, like uh, most of the passages of uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, and at the same time, modern Arabic, like El Ayem Min Taha Hussein, to compare the, lang the Arabic language of the Quran, Al Fusa, with modern Arabic. That was an excellent thing for us to make a comparison and to feel that the language of the Quran was something without any comparison. When I finished my studies, thanks to God, I was in a position to read the Quran without any preconceived idea. We at the beginning without at all a belief in the fact that the Quran might be the word of God. In his book, Seeking Peace at Heart of 2007, Professor Muhammad al Talabi notices that the word mind is mentioned 49 times in the Quran. Science, meaning knowledge in general, is referred to 768 times. The word heart, meaning contemplation, comes in 172 times. Sight, meaning perceiving, is repeated 147 times, whereas the word remembrance, meaning to question and to consider attentively, is mentioned 268 times in the Quran. ومن العجيب أن القرآن فيه 6300 وكذا آية و26 آية 1300 آية تتكلم عن العلم والعلماء آيات التشريع التي تحكم الخلق في علاقاتهم بكل أنواعها عدها بعض المتخصصين ب535 آية Once he mastered Arabic, 
Bukai could find in the Quran a trove of verses laden with calls to read, think, and to discover. He finally produced a short list of those directly related to empirical science. I took notice of a lot of verses uh, at the end that was approximately uh, between uh, 150 uh, and 200 verses and gathered all these verses by discipline, by chapters and, uh, and I was extremely embarrassed. I said to myself, but it appears to me that it is impossible considering what was the story of sciences. But a man have written that almost uh, 14 centuries ago. Seeking scientific precision in his search, Bukai reflects on what could be a scientifically acceptable or unacceptable passage in a certain scripture. He says, What I intend to consider here are the incontrovertible facts, even if science can only provide incomplete data, but they will nevertheless be sufficiently well established to be quoted without fear of error. Perhaps the year 1976 stands out as probably the happiest and most prolific in Dr. Bukai's career. As the year opened, he almost completed a breakthrough study of certain holy scriptural texts in relation to selected modern scientific fields, notably medical examination of the Egyptian mummies. In that area, Bukai had applied his pioneering techniques to two specific pharaohs and, in the interim, succeeded in scientifically identifying the pharaoh of the Exodus. Bukai's study had reached to cover other scientific disciplines of astronomy, geology, biology, botany, embryology, and theoretical physics. The outcome was considered by many as a major breakthrough in understanding the scientific signs of one of those holy scriptures, the Quran. On February 17th, Bukai had relayed the outcome of his team's research, conducted in Cairo, on the mummies of Ramses II and his successor, Mern Ptah, in a lecture delivered at Paris's National Academy of Medicine. In summer, his groundbreaking book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science, was published, crowning several years of research, including five of learning and reading Arabic. On September 26th, the mummy of Ramses II had arrived in Paris for treatment as a result of two years of persistent effort personally initiated and followed through by Bukai, which finally yielded an accord on top levels regarding the Ramses operation. On November 9th, Bukai had to head back once more to building number 16 at Rue Bonaparte. This is one of the oldest and most prestigious of science academies one could clearly see the marks of the French Revolution on its facade. It is the French Academy of Medicine, which was founded in 1731. Only this time, he was there to deliver what was seen by many as an unusual rendering in the Academy's history, a lecture entitled Physiological and Embryological Data in the Quran. In 1976, for the first time, in a lecture at the French Academy of Medicine in Paris, the word Quran appeared. At the very opening of his lecture, Bukai makes a unique reference to a 14-century-old book containing a body of data totally unknown at that age, that is today in total conformity with our present status of knowledge. He added, that in itself stirs difficult problems. Being a religious book adds up supplementary questions to those problems. By examining the Quran, Bukai bluntly stated, 
that the physiologist and the embryologist would be surprised to find references to data in these disciplines, as well as in many others, including the creation of the universe and the aquatic source of life. To provide a sound base for his conclusions, Bukai went on to probe the authenticity of the Quranic text by examining the history and the method of the book's preservation. Immediate registration of the revelation, as it was read by Prophet Muhammad, over a period of 23 years until the book had been collected in its present book form by the third caliph Othman bin Affan in the 7th century. They were stupefied and the question which was put was the following what are you sure that the text of the Quran we have now is the text of the old times. I said them go to our national library and you will be able to find all texts of the Quran of the 8th century of the Christian era. And you will be in a position to compare the text of that time and the text which is widespread now. This was not an objection, that was a question. This lecture has not have been forgotten. Certainly not. The lecture was just the beginning. The phenomenal success of his book, the Bible, the Quran, and science had unleashed unforeseen currents that not even Bukai could have ever seen coming. And it seemed that Maurice Bukai was the first Western scholar to write and publish in that field of comparative studies. <laughs> أنا ناقشت موريس بوكاي في كتبه الثلاث وأنا قمت بمراجعة كتاب أصل الإنسان ترجمة من الفرنسية إلى إلى العربية ومن الإنجليزية إلى العربية شرفت بهذا العمل وهذا أعطاني فرصة لمعرفة فكر موريس بوكاي أكثر. To his surprise, the first French edition of his book had sold about 120,000 copies in the first five months. The book appeared in 1976. And now it is a bestseller in France. The 13th edition in French was in preparation and I have received last year the Golden Book Award. The publisher said me that last year they printed in French 140,000 copies, not including the pocket book editions to be sent to foreign countries. Unlike his early high expectations, Bukai had to suffer, in spite of his repeated explanations, several injustices on two fronts, socially and from the Catholics. Il n'a pas été bien reçu, parfois par certains chrétiens et parfois par certains musulmans. Il en a souffert certainement, parce que on lui a fait des reproches, on lui a fait des critiques qui, qui, qui vraiment l'ont peiné. Et moi j'ai vu ça, sa peine et je trouve qu'on ne doit pas être injuste et qu'il y a eu contre lui des critiques injustes. You do not think that it is a belief in Islam which would have been as the starting point of the sea. Not at all. It is true scientific reasoning. I said the Quran cannot be the work of a man. هذا الكتاب أثر غضبا شديدا من طرف الكنيسة وكان الأب لنور يعرف كتاب بيوكاي من الرهبان الذين باقوا على صلاتهم الودية مع موريس دكتور بوكاي كان يحب الحوار الحوار بين العلم والدين كان طبيب ورجل العلم وكان مؤمن وكان يعتقد بأن لابد من العلم والدين يمشوا معنا هذا فضل موريس بوقاي وكون هذه الشهادة تأتي من رجل غربي مسيحي كاثوليكي لا علاقة له بالمنطقة العربية وتأتي بهذه القوة وهذا الوضوح وبهذه الموضوعية هذا الذي حمدناه له it's a terrible thing when in your life, when you are almost 50, you have in your mind, you say, but maybe, maybe I am completely wrong about uh, the Holy Scriptures, but it's terrible. Alors, I wanted absolutely to, to improve my knowledge concerning the Quran without any particular aim, not at all. 
وقعت قطيعة لا شك فيها بين موش بكاي ووسطه. Oui, certains chrétiens ont pensé qu'il était musulman, qu'il défendait mieux l'islam que le christianisme. Et certains chrétiens ont cru, à tort à mon avis, qu'il avait écrit ce livre pour dire euh, l'islam est vrai et le christianisme est faux. Ce n'était pas du tout son idée. Mais certains chrétiens lui ont reproché finalement de, de montrer trop bien les valeurs de l'islam, le Coran, en disant le Coran et la science s'appliquent très bien ensemble, tandis que la Bible et la science ne s'appliquent pas. My problem is very simple, to say the truth. In 1976, it didn't seem that the social pressure, subtle or explicit, that Bukai has had to fall under, could bend the determined scholar as he declared his major conclusion. Quran and science are intertwined. Bukai انتصر على الكبر وانتصر على الضغط الاجتماعي. So, years later, while still basking in the phenomenal success of his first book, the Bible, the Quran, and science, Bukai's life plan has shown a major shift. He decided to dedicate all his time to scientific research in relation to the scriptures. In 1982, Bukai quit the medical profession for good to walk in unexpected ground. On April 16, 1980, Dr. Bukai was a night guest on Journal de la Nuit. The news show aired on Channel One of the French television. Introduced as the author of the Bible, the Quran, and science, Bukai was interviewed to comment on his contribution to the Islamic conference held in London's Albert Hall in solidarity with Afghanistan soon after the communist Soviet invasion in December 24, 1979. Bukai says, indeed, the Islamic world is now boasting a considerable power that cannot be ignored. It certainly plays a sizable role in the development of industry and trade worldwide. Of course, no one can underestimate the rising value of energy, of oil. As history tells us, in each era, some countries play a major role in our world. It seems now that the Islamic world is called upon to play such a role. With an ever-increasing number of prints and translations of his book, the Bible, the Quran, and science, it seemed that the school of exploring scientific signs in the Holy Scriptures is really gaining new momentum. Il était donc médecin, il était compétent dans les sciences. Il n'avait pas une formation théologique vraiment très très profonde. Il n'avait pas fait d'études de théologie chrétienne et même musulmane. Il connaissait le Coran, mais il n'avait pas étudié les grands auteurs coraniques de musulmans. Il n'avait pas fait l'exégèse, par exemple. Et du côté chrétien aussi, il, il n'était pas très au courant de, des recherches de la de la de l'exégèse et de, de l'histoire du christianisme. كتابين القرآن من ناحية والكتاب المقدس من ناحية أخرى كان صيحة ودويا علميا كان غربيا لم يكن شرقيا يتهم بأنه يكتب بحكم العاطفة شهادة مثقف غربي ثقافة عالية وجد أن القرآن بكل الموضوعية والحيادية والتجرد ليست في ثمة شائبة فيما يتعلق بالعلم الحديث ردة فعل المسلمين وترحابهم الكبير بكتاب الدكتور بيكاي لها كذلك علاقة بنقد الجمهور الفرنسي الكاثوليكي له ذلك أن الكثير من منا المسلمون نرى فيه تفضيل وتقديم للقرآن على الإنجيل وعلى الكتاب المقدس وكأنما نستعمله حجة عليهم. Naturally, reactions to Bukai's argument had to juxtapose, depending on one's perspective. As is always, those who sail high seas are destined to be struck by strong winds of criticism, not all necessarily favorable, fair, or decent. Mm -hmm. 
je, je trouvais en lui beaucoup de, de volonté, de, de, de spiritualité, de fidélité, de, de dialogue, de, de, de volonté, de paix, et je trouve que cela mérite le respect. C'est toujours la même chose, les gens qui, 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 a, qui avancent des idées ne sont pas toujours compris. As it happened, Bukai's book had stirred an already heated debate between two old adversaries, the evolutionist and the creationist. One of the evolutionist arguments were trumpeted loud and clear in an article entitled Quran Science, Scientific Miracles from the 7th Century, published by Turkish physicist and philosopher Taner Edis. In an all sarcastic tone, the writer defends his case against the apologetics who hunt for scientific miracles in the Quran. On top of the list, of course, comes Maurice Bukai, who was introduced by Edis as a French surgeon popular in Islamic circles, as Western scientists acknowledging that the Quran did not contain a single statement that was assailable from a modern scientific point of view. Next to Bukai on the creationist list is Professor Keith Moore, the Canadian apologetic scientist quoted by Edis as stating, Statements referring to human reproduction and development are scattered throughout the Quran. It is only recently that the scientific meaning of some of these verses has been appreciated fully. Edis ends up judging more by this verdict. This embryological apologetic is very popular, and I doubt this statement has originated with more. Mohammed could not have known these facts about human development in the seventh century because most of them were not discovered until the twentieth century. Muslims and others are justified in concluding that these facts could only have been revealed to Muhammad by the one known who knows all about us, not only about how we developed, but how we live and function. Murs Bikai lam yakun lahutiyan wa laysat lahu al-thaqafa lahutiyan wa lam yakun rahiban kana tabiban min ashrat al-atibba The Parisian gastroenterologist of fame and the passionate Egyptologue Dr. Maurice Bukai enjoyed the merit of combining his scholarly knowledge of the biblical and Quranic texts with his ancient Egypt background to embark on a new journey that crowned his quest for harmonies of the Holy Writs with modern science. He wrote, I had journeyed to Egypt during the second half of 1974 in search of various archaeological and medical data concerning certain pharaohs. In particular, I was after documents pertaining to the Exodus. My intention was to examine certain passages in the Bible and the Quran under the light of recent information provided by Egyptian archaeology. During my first visit to the royal mummy's room, I wondered whether or not my plans for this research would lead to conclusive findings and whether I would be able to effectively justify the confidence the Egyptian authorities had placed in my project. My access to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, where my studies were to be carried out, was due to President Sadat, who had given direct orders that I was to be allowed to perform any type of research, providing, of course, no damage was done to the mummies. In my own country, I was not officially entitled to carry out such research, nor was any endorsement given to me by the French government or a university. My presence at the museum, where I was very kindly granted every possible facility for research, was uniquely the result of personally contacting certain people. My initial contact was Mrs. Sadat, whom I knew through my medical practice. Her family had granted me its confidence after the successful treatment of a family member. I took the opportunity of informing Mrs. Sadat of my conclusions regarding the likelihood that a particular pharaoh may have taken part in the Exodus. 
At that time, however, my theories were supported merely by data drawn from my study of history, archaeology, and hieroglyphic texts. She gracefully agreed in no time to present a request on my behalf to President Sadat. With extreme gratitude, I later paid a visit to the President himself. At the time, there was not a single harbinger that might have helped me foresee the developments that were to follow. At first, I was, of course, fascinated by the outward appearance of both pharaohs when I entered the mummy's room of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo in 1974. In that year, 3,212 years had elapsed since the death of Ramses II. The only parts of the body of Ramses II that were visible to visitors in 1974 were the head and the left hand, the rest being draped with coarse linen not unlike burlap. The mummy was laying supine in an open coffin, visible through the glass sides of a rectangular display case with a removable glass cover. How the mighty had fallen. The sight of the hand, a symbol of power and force, led me to imagine Ramses II as a young sovereign and warrior during the first 20 years of his rule. The purpose of my own project was to examine the possibilities of making new discoveries and to extend the research to branches of medicine that had not yet been included. The research was to focus on the remains of two pharaohs. Mernpeta, research in the field of forensic medicine, was to prove of great value in determining the cause of his death, and Ramses II, thought by many biblical scholars to have been the pharaoh of the Exodus. It seemed to me that the experts' arguments were weak in terms of factual evidence and that precise data on the condition of the pharaohs at the end of their lives could cast light on the matter, providing indisputable evidence. Our earlier studies had already shown that the mummy of Ramses II and likewise other pharaohs' mummies had suffered serious damage before the bodies of numerous kings were discovered in the necropolis at Thebes nearly a century ago. In the case of Ramses II, the damage was twofold. First, structural, the extent of which had already been determined by x-rays. And secondly, biological, the causes of which had already been discovered as well. I discussed these problems several times during my talks with President Sadat and those around him. On January 23, 1976, President Sadat announced his decision to entrust the mummy of Ramses II to France. He asked me personally to announce the measures that needed to be taken to rescue the other deteriorating mummies after Ramses' stay in Paris. The Pharaoh arrived at Le Bourget Airport on September 26, 1976, where he was received with full military honors. The case containing the mortal remains of the king was removed from the plane. From the airport, the mummy had been transferred to the Museum of Anthropology for hospitalization 
in one of the specially prepared rooms. On June 29, 1977, Pottery Match reported that the truck containing the packing case and its occupant was ordered to pass by one of his two Luxor obelisks at Place de la Concorde so that the ancient monarch's soul could contemplate his glory inscribed on the stone in dithyrambic terms. Operation Ramses lasted almost eight months and was directed by Christiane de roche noblecourt curator of Egyptian antiquities at the Louvre, and by Professor Lionel Bellou, director of the Museum of Anthropology. Eventually, the genuine French passion about Egyptology, as dubbed by a French newspaper, had inevitably sparked a clash of interest among the doctors and the curators. The first casualty was Bukai, who had been totally denied the honor of participating in the rescue of Ramsey's mummy. Only after the conclusions of his team's research were made public in three lectures, given upon invitation from the Department of Egyptian Antiquities at the Louvre in autumn 1975, and the other two at the Institute of Human Paleontology in May 1976. By summer of 1976, Bukai's book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science, was already setting a stir in motion in some Parisian circles. And as Dr. Bukai had been deprived the honor of being at the reception of the mummy, he single-handedly initiated its treatment two years earlier. He was denied even attendance at the official farewell ceremony given to the celebrated Pharaoh Tuesday morning, the 10th of May, 1977, at Le Bourget Airport. By the time Ramsay II died, at the platinum age of 90, following a glorious rule that lasted almost 67 years, 1279 to 1212 BC, he had apparently outlived 12 of his sons. So it was his 13th, Mernpeta, who succeeded him to be the fourth in the line of the pharaohs of the 19th dynasty. At the time of his ascension, he was probably nearly 60 years old. Mernpeta's reign was short-lived, perhaps only nine or ten years, as well as rather dull in comparison with that of his star predecessor. According to the Oxford History of Ancient Egypt, he ruled from 1213 until 1203 BC. Mernpeta's tomb is marked KV-8 at the Valley of the Kings on the Nile's west bank, opposite of today's Luxor, ancient Thebes. When his mummy was not found in his tomb by 19th century archaeologists, they concluded that his body had drowned and lost forever in the water walls of the Red Sea while pursuing the fleeing Israelites according to the Old Testament's Exodus. But the theory had been refuted when the mummy of Mernpeta was discovered by Victor Loray in 1898 in the Valley of the Kings. The study of both the Qurani and biblical narrations is specifically interesting here, mainly because the two narrations share a lot in common. There are certainly divergences but the biblical narration has a considerable historical value. It does help to identify the pharaoh, or rather, the two pharaohs in question. This hypothesis, which starts with the Bible, 
is complemented by the information contained in the Quran. Modern data are added to these two scriptural sources. Bukai singles out one major discrepancy in the narration of both texts regarding the fate of the Pharaoh's body. The writer of Exodus tells us that after the Israelites crossed the sea without wetting their feet, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Exodus 23 And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Exodus 28 through 29. So the Israelites escaped, and the Pharaoh perished. But his body was rescued and found, a very important detail not mentioned in the biblical narration. We read in the Quran, chapter 10, verses 90 to 92. Thus we caused the children of Israel to pass in safety through the divided sea. Then Pharaoh and his host followed them in ruthless injustice and aggression until when the drowning waters overwhelmed him. He said, I believe that there is no God but the one in whom the children of Israel have believed. And I am now of those who are Muslims in willing submission to God alone. It was said, Now you believe, while before you have truly disobeyed your Lord, and you were ever of those who sowed corruption? Rather today we shall deliver you, preserving you in your body only, so that you will become a sign for those who come after you, that God is exalted in his power, for indeed many of the people are heedless of our signs. As a young man, Moses, after slaying an Egyptian, fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. Exodus 15. Bukai points out an important detail mentioned in Exodus 23. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died. Exodus identifies that king being the one who ordered the Hebrews by forced labor to build new cities and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities of Python and Ramses. Exodus 11. Bukai concludes that Exodus, with the returning 80-year-old Moses, could only have taken place during the reign of Ramses' successor. So, one Pharaoh died during Moses' stay at Midian, while the other perished pursuing the fleeing Israelites. Not a single Pharaoh for Moses then, but two. Ramses II, Pharaoh of the Oppression, and Munpatah, Pharaoh of the Exodus. Having published the results of his examination of the mummies of both Pharaohs, freely conducted in the Cairo Museum during 1974 and 1975, Dr. Bukai had headed on the afternoon of February the 17th, 1976, to the French National Academy of Medicine to present a paper entitled, Application of Medical Methods to the examination of Pharaonic mummies, in which he introduced the conclusions reached by his Egyptian Franco team. In his book of 1987, Mummies of the Pharaohs, Modern Medical Investigations, 
Bukai dissects in detail these conclusions. He says, It was apparent to my colleague Michel Durgon and me that mummification had been carried out with perfect success on the body. Visual examination of it was not enough. However, what we needed was material proof. This we obtained by microscopic analysis of a tiny fragment of the mummy. It was examined under the microscope by Professors Jacques Mignot and Michel Durigon. They were thus able to show the perfect preservation of the smallest anatomical details visible, the transversal striations of the fibrilla, as we have already seen on other mummies. For it to have retained these microscopic features to this day, the body must have been embalmed while in good condition. Otherwise, decay and putrefaction would have set in. Bukai continued, The lacuna in the right part of the thorax may well have been the result of an injury sustained during the subject's lifetime. The cranial lacuna is of great forensic importance. Its presence may suggest a craniocerebral lesion received during the subject's lifetime, a fracture with a penetrating wound seriously injuring the brain. In all likelihood, this lesion caused a very rapid death. After grueling research, the final conclusion was reached in Bukai's words. This would have brought on death very quickly, and the body had been submerged before or after the pharaoh was killed. Whatever the case, he does not appear to have stayed in the water for long. I have searched for a contradiction of any kind between our medical observations and the narrations of the Exodus contained in the book of Exodus in the Bible and the Quran. But I can find no argument to oppose the theory I hereby maintain. Given the present state of our knowledge, the only valid hypothesis that can be advanced is that Merenpetan, Ramses II's successor, met a tragic end during the Exodus. This has been formally proved by medical examination and fits perfectly with the passage in the Quran on the rapid retrieval of the body. Rather today, we shall deliver you, preserving you in your body only, so that you will become a sign for those who come after you, that God is exalted in his power, for indeed, many of the people are heedless of our signs. Here is a material presence of the mummified body of the man who knew Moses, resisted his pleas, pursued him as he took flight, and lost his life in the process. His earthly remains were saved by the will of God from destruction to become assigned to posterity, as it is written in the Quran. Bukai wraps up his argument with a piece of advice for those who seek, in modern data, a proof of the veracity of the Holy Scriptures. He asserts, They will find a magnificent illustration of the verses of the Quran when they see the retrieved body of the Exodus Pharaoh by simply visiting the royal mummies room in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. <laughs>